Welcome to the Futurati Podcast. Any member of the Futurati is somebody who believes in the power of the future. We know there's a better world ahead, and we indeed have the power to make it so. In our podcast, we talk to the best minds in the world about the most urgent problems facing mankind today, and we hope you learn as much from them as we do. I'm Thomas Fry, a professional futurist and keynote speaker. And I'm Trent Fowler, a machine learning engineer and author. Thank you for joining us. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for listening to the Futurati Podcast. Tonight, we're joined by Ben Landau-Taylor. Ben is a senior researcher at Bismarck Analysis, where he focuses on power, industry, economics, and social dynamics. If you enjoy this interview, please don't forget to like the episode and subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to check out our website, futuritipodcast.com. Ben, thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Let's hear a little bit about your background, your interests, and what brought you to working on the problems that you're working on today. Yeah, so I've been studying society for uh, a while now, in general, just trying to understand how this whole complicated mess that we all find ourselves inside of works. Uh, So I've been doing that through uh, a few different approaches over the years. There's a lot of different uh, methods and so forth that people have tried. Uh, the what I've been doing for uh, the past uh, five years or so, six years or so, uh, was since I met uh, Samo Boria, who has his approach of uh, great founder theory is the general theoretical uh, method that he uses that I've been learning from him and trying to apply that to a bunch of new types of areas, especially industry and uh, like just trying to take this sort of very historically informed, very case study based approach to trying to look at the important things that happen and how the different pieces of like the core functional institutions of a society, how they work or how they don't work and what's going on in our current setup and how this is, you know, every, every place and time is unique in some ways and very, very normal in others. And so how this fits into the general sweep of what's happened with humanity and where it is likely to go. That is a rather grand ambition. I, I find that a fascinating set of questions that you're, you're tackling. And I wanted to ask you about the methodologies to which you alluded earlier. You, you said that every historical period is unique in some ways and it's consistent in other ways. And social science is famously difficult to do proper, I guess, scientific experiments on. It, it's very difficult to pursue truth in the same way that you would in physics, which I think leads people to drawing spurious conclusions or finding you know correlations that aren't really meaningful in any uh, serious way. They don't elucidate the actual underlying mechanisms of society and and point the way to their, their evolution. So I'm just curious as to how you approach that, how you go about finding truths that apply in in different frames and in different uh, time periods. Uh, Yeah. So uh, I I mentioned the case study method very briefly, which is essentially using the deep dives into particular cases as the primary uh, research tool that we have of, and like a, it's very important to be looking at them from enough different perspectives. Cause if you're trying to understand, you know, political dynamics and everything you're looking at is, you know, from 1970 or later, then you're not going to know which of the things that you're finding are specific to the time period and which are more general truths about humanity. Uh, so you have to be looking broad enough that, you will find, you know, because there are a bunch of things that are very specific to the time that we're in. And there's also a bunch of things that have not changed since as long as recorded history. And there's other things that, you know, have been stable since the printing press and so forth. And the only way to know which is which is to be looking at a wide enough sweep from enough different places and times that you can tell the general from the particular. So the general thing that we use for selecting case studies is it's very theoretically driven. So we work a lot with like theories of, oh, this is how this thing works. Here's how that thing works, Uh, which we try to have at least a provisional theory, even if we're not yet at the point of like, here's a really solid, we're super confident in this, which the goal is to eventually get to. And in a few places, I do feel like that. 
Uh, but if you have like a general, oh, it seems like this is important, maybe, or it could work like this. And then you look into a case where you're not going to understand, you're not going to be able to understand how that case went without getting some insight into whatever is the overall theory uh, that you're trying to get a better handle on. So I've been trying to understand finance lately, and I am definitely not done. The way that finance interacts with political power is a very complicated topic, and there's a lot going on. But as I was trying to first start getting a handle on that, I was looking a lot into what was happening with the negotiations around uh, the all of the war debts and the gold standard that were happening after the First World War around the time of the Great Depression, because like the way that all the bankers are bound up with the political powers and the nations that they are part of and the way that the military force and the is being sort of tacitly used as pressure and sometimes not tacitly used, like when the French just take over a bunch of parts of Western Germany because the Germans were behind on paying back the war reparations. So like, this is a case which, you know, exactly the type of thing that I'm trying to understand is sort of very nakedly at play here. So using that as the selection of here's how you know which things to look into in order to get insight on whatever the live questions are that you're trying to figure out is the main way of choosing what to look at, deciding which of these cases that we have to use. So so with your approach, uh, you're coming at it vastly differently than most people do. Um, what, what's your sense as to the big thing that most people are getting wrong when they're uh, kind of looking at how we, how we ended up here? Uh, yeah, so the so like contemporary social science like yeah it's often done very differently it's often done in a very quantitative way uh which definitely has its place but i think people are very often way too quick to start quantifying things where like turning the things into numbers and like making them very crisp like that it works really well when you've got like a really good breakdown of what are the things that you're looking at when you have and when you have measuring tools that are really good relative to the size of the effect you're trying to measure. And, you know, uh, in many physical sciences, of course, we have that, like we have, you know, when we're dealing with steel or something, we know that like mass is important. We know that tensile strength, you've got this really precise concept. We can measure it super precisely relative to the uses we're putting it to. This works great. There's some areas of social science where this works pretty well. Like if we're trying to talk about like, you know, what the fertility rate is among a particular demographic, then that's a very meaningful number, which you can get a lot from. If you're looking at like the population and how many people exist in this area, then, you know, censuses across different times and places aren't always great, but at least in many cases, they are quite good and you can tell a lot from them. Uh, but there's a lot of times where people will like try to take something like how democratic a society is and try to put a number on that and like, there's this sort of pretense that whether that number is an 82 or an 87 means something really crisp and right. real, or that maybe it doesn't. But if you take 500 things like this and average them together, then that will produce something that you can stand on. And I just don't think that's true. And this is relatively recent. For most of, uh, most of human history, this is not how social science was done. And it's sort of like through the last, like, I don't know, 60-ish years or so, maybe 70, that this has become, you know, slowly more and more prominent. And a lot of the things that get measured seem to me more abstract, a lot more airy. Like, if you look at economics, if you read a lot of the economic work that's being used for policy in, like, the 40s, you're going to be seeing, you know, here's how many tons of steel we produce, here's how many shoes we're exporting, things where it's feel like what it is, is a lot more, you know, grounded and it's clear what it is and what it isn't in a way that a lot of, you know, when you're talking about more abstracted measures, like happiness, the inflation metrics or like Gini coefficients, it's a lot harder to tell what those actually are. And you have to get way into the weeds of how they're measured before you know where you can lean on them and where you can't. And a lot of people, don't do that and just start leading them in places where you can't. And I think that leads a lot of people down 
you know, paths that don't really lead anywhere. Yeah. It, it seems almost hysterically rigorous. You know, it's like we, we very carefully tried to define this concept and look at all the math we've done, look at all the numbers we have. And it seems like there's a lot more there than is often the case. I, I share that impression as well. Yeah. It's often sort of like it produces a dazzling effect. And then when you go and do a close reading, then it kind of falls apart. So, Much of it. There's some, there's some of it that I think is actually very solid, but I would consider this an exception rather than the rule. A lot of social scientists think that most, most of the social science is very bad. It's just that we all disagree about which. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what are the areas, what are the areas that you think are actually pretty solid? Uh, so I think that, uh, you know, there's a lot of the so microeconomics, I think, is very good for the areas that it tries to say things about. Uh, also, like largely because it's, you know, it make, it's very upfront about what the assumptions are, where it applies. Here are the features of a market. If you don't have these features, it doesn't really apply and it's not intended to. In the macroecon, people sort of selectively forget about those. But in micro, I find that people are much better at remembering where it does and doesn't apply. Uh, so that one, like, it doesn't cover everything, but the things it covers, it covers really well. Uh, that one is uh, quite good. Uh, there's a bunch of the more theoretical stuff uh, from, like, the pat from, like, the middle and the early parts of the 20th century. I think there's some very good theory from there. Uh, so Marxist class analysis is really interesting because I think the general approach of looking at the classes and their interests and how they faction around each other is really fruitful. And then a lot of the more dogmatic Marxists will get stuck on, and the particular classes that we have to look at are the ones that Marx was writing about. I think this, the situation has changed, the class dynamics, like the landscape of classes is different. I don't think you should be locked into exactly those classes, but using the general breakdown that Marx used to generate that, I think is actually still a very valuable method. Interesting. So I, my understanding is that Marx never adequately defined what a class was and that the third volume of capital actually ends right where he was going to try to define what a class was like, like make that concept more concrete. And so I don't necessarily disagree. I think a class analysis is probably a fruitful lens, but I'm curious as to why you think Marx in particular had that right, especially given that much of the economic edifice of Marxism is based on the long debunked labor theory of value. Uh, yeah, which I, I certainly, yeah, that's about the only thing from Marx that I'm consciously using it, but he is either the maybe not the originator, because this is the type of thing that I expect to be independently invented a bunch of times in somewhat different forms. But the current tradition that we have in a lot of the language is traceable back to him. So he is, at the very least, the popularizer of the method in the way that it's often used. Class and analysis? I do think he should, yeah, class, yes, okay. class analysis. And I do think he should get credit for that, even if a lot of his other stuff has not held up nearly as well. So when you're you're doing a deep dive on finance now, how do you assemble resources? How do you choose what to read? How do you collate the different claims made? I mean, is there a method to, or do you just stack a bunch of books up and kind of work from from start to finish? Yeah. So, like, my general approach for this or anything else is you want to be reading something like eighty percent specific things that happened and twenty percent theory. Uh, you know, this isn't like precise. I'm not like weighing the books to make sure they match exactly, <laughs> but I'm spending most of my time reading, you know, a biography of this, uh, uh, you know, some, uh, some like chairman of, uh, of a big company of uh, guy I was looking into from General Electric or like, you know, letters between the different people who were involved in like the negotiations around renegotiating the, uh, the war reparations or looking into the specifics of the currency exchange rates and things like that will be most of what I do. Uh, generally trying to, to be leaning on primary sources or if not that, then things that are themselves leading, you know, secondary sources that are doing a lot of, you know, reporting and summarizing with a few spot checks to make sure that they're like actually reliable although there really is no substitute for actually reading the words of the people who were there. Uh, 
and mostly just trying to be like, so what the hell was actually happening? Right. If you were some banker, like what, what was it that you were doing? If you were some business owner who needed to interact with it, like what was that like? And just trying to get like the fact dump of the time in as much detail as possible for at least for the really deep case studies. So and you, like from a few different angles for the really serious ones. You, you may I, was have, having, I, was, I was having a conversation with <clears throat> with Jimmy Wales, and he was uh, <clears throat> he was telling me the story about the inventor of the airplane. Now it turns out that m- most of the world thinks that the inventor of the airplane was the Wright brothers, but uh, the the country of France believes that it was a person from. Argentina that came to France that um, the Wright brothers actually made a plane that uh, the the engine actually t- drove it forward, but it didn't have the power or the ability to go up. And so this gentleman from Argentina, uh, roughly the same time, actually invented a plane that could actually had some lift to it and would go up in the air. Now, he had to sort through that to, uh, with all of the input from all of the p- readers of Wikipedia. And, uh, and it was rather interesting that, uh, you know, how they have the ability to c- declare who the inventor of the airplane was and, and who was, but then they put a lot of side notes in there to explain what all was going on at that time. And so the actual details, well, the history books, uh, for me, growing up, always had a very definitive. This is the person that invented this product, and it was very cut and dried. There was no background story, no um, before and after what happened, and uh, and so with Wikipedia, they're getting input from literally thousands of people on these different stories, and I found it absolutely fascinating uh, to to find out what they have to go through to actually kind of decide what the right answer is for these different questions. Oh, yeah. It's a huge mess, especially with technology, because so many different people want credit. So many different countries want credit. Right. You know, like I was looking into uh, like the the history of steel and the Bessemer process, which is this way of making much, much more steel, much, much more cheaply, which, you know, the British say was was invented by Bessemer. Uh, and then I'm reading in on that and like a bunch of Americans are saying, no, it was this American guy. And then I have to go look into that and like get the patent of that guy to be like, oh, no, it's kind of fake. It was actually, you know, like this was not the thing he was inventing was not close to what Bessemer invented. And this is, you know, just a bunch of things, you know, it's boosted because of national pride. And, you know, th- there's always stuff like this where you have to get deep into the details because sometimes when you look in here, it's not that unusual to find that the common narrative that's put on Wikipedia or in the, you know, high school textbook or whatever, those are usually mostly right, but sometimes they're, you know, just wrong or more often they are leaving out a lot of really important nuance. Like, you know, the steam engine, you know, attributed to James Watt, he made the ones that were really, really industrially significant, but, you know, as anyone who's done a deep dive on this knows, the Newcomen engine, which came before but didn't have the separate condenser, was much less efficient, was a very important step forward and Watt probably wouldn't have been able to do what he did without it. And so the complexities that get added here, yeah, if you want to like get a precise picture of what was happening that you can be doing good theory work from, you really have to get into the weeds. I often find that is also the case when you're looking at the date ranges for historical epics, like the Renaissance or the Enlightenment, or like when did the Hundred oh. Years' War start? Was it was it 1455 or was it like three years later when they actually had the first major battle? That kind of thing. It's it's always interesting. Like, how, who is the person that sits down and says, "No, we're, in this book, we're going to call it 1455, or we're going to give the dates of the Renaissance as starting in the late 14th century as opposed to like the early 15th century?" Like, who is it that makes those decisions, and what's the criteria that they use? Because it's really important. It shapes kind of the the story that you tell about the world, which implicitly informs all the decisions you make throughout your life. There's a lot of power in the people who name things, who tell the stories, who craft the narratives that go into our implicit theories of history. Yeah. And like so much of it. Yeah. Like the world wars are my favorite example of this uh, because like the fact that we have, oh, you know, there was just a bunch of world of wars. A few of them were across the world, but that wasn't a big deal. But then world war one, 
you know it's the first one because it has one in the name. Right. So it was completely different. Like, which like I don't think like I would consider it to be probably the Third World War, but right. like you know, I would the Seven Years War, the Napoleonic Wars, and then like the two famous ones that we still call World Wars. But the power of naming them that just feeds into this idea that we have that sort of history started in the 20th century and all the stuff before that. It was some sort of different world that we don't have to think too hard about. That's very interesting. I, um, I wanted to get your reaction to something. I, I've always wanted to ask either you or, or Samo about this and it, it has to do with, with methodology and how you approach history. So I would say that the, the school of economics that I align most closely with is the Austrian school of economics, which famously takes this deductive approach to studying economic phenomenon. And so, for example, you can know that a, that a doubling in the minimum wage will lead to unemployment axiomatically. It just kind of follows a priori from an analysis of the concepts. You do a lot of empirical work in figuring out how that actually cashes out because there are lots of places where you can increase the minimum wage and you don't see unemployment because there are other countervailing factors. And so I've always right. just wondered, I mean, you know a lot about history and, I, and you know a lot about economics as well. Do you find that approach at all compelling? Do you think that's kind of misguided or would you take a different tack as you go about the process of studying economic and historical questions? Yeah. So economics is a, is a really interesting one because you've got all of these mathematically coherent models, which make a bunch of assumptions about human psychology, some explicitly, some implicitly. And like, the, the, it's just really important to how closely these work as an approximation of human behavior uh, is, uh, like, how much can you rely on these approximate economic models depends a lot on how closely human psychology follows the assumptions that they're making. And I think that a lot of economists, including the Austrians, but certainly not only the Austrians, I think this is common to most of the discipline, like vastly overestimate the amount of human economic behavior that is governed by people thinking about supply and demand, thinking in terms of markets, and vastly discount the amount that is uh, of decision making that people do by basically custom, by, bas by like what is the appropriate thing you know, deductively, you can prove that as people are seeking to maximize profit and like going over the threshold of, is this worth it to me? Like, uh, uh, am I getting more value than I'm spending? Then like, yes, you can prove that with those assumptions, these are the decisions people make. But in practice, people often won't make that decision because they know that like, this is the fair wage or this is what is, or this is what is best practices that everyone else is doing. They can't really tell exactly how much value is being provided to their restaurant by the extra marginal dishwasher that they're hiring. They're sort of ballparking it and guessing and like, uh, you know, the, there's assumptions about quantification that, you know, in the middle of a business, you don't have this sort of clean, crisp, you know, insight into the values being exchanged in the way that the economic theories assume you do as a, as a sort of simplifying assumption. You find that people are thinking much more this way and have access to that type of quantitative data much, much more strongly when they're like CEOs of major corporations who are actually described pretty well by the assumptions about like rational economic behavior, oh, which is interesting because part of the reason for that is that they've studied the economics and so they're being shaped by the theory at the same time. But like the amount that the law and, and the custom is like shaping the, all of this stuff about how who's being paid for what and how much is I think a lot more important in terms of setting the actual prices than a lot of the mathematical economic theories give it credit for. That, that's interesting. It reminds me of something that Samo said on, on Twitter the other day. This has nothing to do specifically with Austrian economics, but he was deriding macroeconomics. And he was saying, you, know, you probably shouldn't spend that much time on macro. What you should do is study micro and then anthropology and then maybe sociology. And that probably will give you a far better predictive framework for analyzing society than endless iterations of macroeconomic theory is that I mean it sounds like you would agree with that I definitely agree with that like I got my degree in macroeconomic theory and it has been it has really not helped me as much as <laughs> like as I hoped at the time as much as a lot of those other approaches that Samo was talking about like I've just it just it's a lot of yeah like the field as a whole just doesn't, it's not very predictive and it's 
there are exceptions, but most macroeconomists just seem more concerned with the mathematical coherence than with how well it empirically describes what's happening. And I wish I had noticed that before I got the degree, but oh well. <laughs> well, we all make we all make mistakes when we're young and foolish. Um, I feel like if that's my big college regret, I'm not doing too bad. No, no, that's, <laughs> there, there are far far worse things to regret. Um, with respect to anthropology and sociology, I, I've always kind of wanted to study those, but it seems like the field, and I'm just saying this as an outsider, it could be totally wrong, that the, the fields have ideas from postmodernism and various branches of philosophy that are kind of problematic baked into <coughs> the foundations. And so I wonder if it might not be a, a pretty Herculean job to figure out which parts of anthropology and sociology are not so infected and therefore are more useful in integration with macroeconomics and therefore predicting society. So, I mean, if you've looked at those things, is that a fair characterization of the field? Have you had to go back 50 years to find sociology that's, that's pretty good and, and not uh, filtered through this lens? Uh, do you disagree with me? You think the lens is perfectly fine? Like, what are your, what's your response? Uh, to that? I, I think you're absolutely right. I think that Sturgeon's law applies here as it does in almost everywhere else, which is 90% of everything is crap. And, <laughs> you know, like the, uh, the, you have to sort through and find the good 10% of the stuff. Uh, I do think anthropology's heyday was in the early 20th century. There's still <laughs> some good work, but it's fewer and far between. And I don't, I'm a lot less inclined to pick through all of it. Uh, but I, but in addition to, you don't just want to read the work. You, you want to read enough of the work that you can get a sense of the method and then just start doing your own sociology on the areas that are important to you. Do your own anthropology. Like, if you're studying finance, go to where the financiers are and do anthropology. Like we went to the World Economic Forum and met a lot of the people there in order to like do anthropology, get a sense of the culture. That was like a big part of how we're trying to understand what's going on here. Uh, one I'm, just, of my, I'm just imagining you and Samo with like David Attenborough narrating the World Economic <laughs> Forum as they're like talking to each other and messing around with their Excel spreadsheets. Yeah, if we could get a good narrator to come with <laughs> us, like you could you could absolutely produce like a Planet Earth documentary about the people you meet at places like this. It would be, <laughs> I would have fun. <laughs> so one of one of the big changes that's been going on is that the internet has given us the ability to be far more aware of everything happening in the world. And this awareness is increasing um, on, on a kind of minute by minute basis as, as we move along. But somewhere along the way, uh, people started figuring out how to manipulate our awareness and how to They've, they, they figured out how we, we do our searches, how we discover new things uh, in the online world, and they try to manipulate the flow of information around the world. And this has dramatically changed um, kind of our perception of what's right and what's wrong. Um, that there's, there's actually a, a really interesting case. Um, the two gentlemen that were given the Nobel Prize for an for the discovery of graphene uh, in 2004 from the University of Manchester, um, it was it was discovered not too long after that that the the actual inventor of graphene got a patent on it in 2002, two years before they got the Nobel Prize, and um, then so the Nobel Committee just never bothered to check the patent records to see if anybody actually had a patent on this discovery. And, and so the actual inventor of graphene was this Dr. Borjang in Akron, Ohio. And uh, he's got a little laboratory there and is just uh, doing some amazing work and just got totally overlooked. So then he gets kind of written out of the history books as a result of this Nobel Prize. And for one of the probably one of the most interesting discoveries of the century. So um, we're, we're dealing with lots of moving pieces and moving parts that are kind of hard to, uh, hard to quantify and assemble at the, in the right order. Um, how do you account for that? Yeah, I think that there's just no substitute for going, yeah, for like doing the legwork to check enough of these things into 
all of the details that you will find what's actually going on in the cases where you can and to just, yeah. And to be aware, especially as you're looking into things that happened, you know, longer and longer ago, this was from, you know, like 20 years ago. So this is still close enough that as you go deeper, all of the records are still going to be there. The people are probably still alive. So this can be traced down, but like, if you're looking into something that happened in like, you know, 1593, then like (laughs) you, you know, that some percentage of the things you're looking into you know, the stories that are being told aren't necessarily the real thing. Maybe you go to the primary source and it's been lost. You go to the primary source and it's by a really self-interested guy who's maybe just telling you what he wants you to think. And just know that you don't know for sure. You only have these pieces of evidence which suggest a certain certain thing. But like maybe there was some, you know, equivalent of the of the real inventor that just is lost to the historical record. So you have to be very careful about what you know based on what evidence you don't want to be falsely thinking you know a lot more certainly than you do which is a very tricky tightrope to walk and like you can't there isn't enough hours in the day to check absolutely everything so i just try to take what i think of as like a pyramid shape uh to the investigations where there's a sort of like sharp tip of the pyramid where you're going in enough letter enough detail to like be reading all of the people's letters and you're confident that if the real inventor is out there in the historical record, you're going to find it. And then like a somewhat wider base of things where you're not going quite that deep, but you're reading other people who hopefully have. And then like a wider base where you're, you know, maybe just reading a Wikipedia article or like whatever, you know, the the one chapter from the book and calibrating on the very specific ones to be like, how much can I trust this type of more general source where I don't have the time to go into a ton of hyper-specific detail and sort of using those to refine your epistemic sense of smell so that you can tell, okay, this is a thing I can put a fair amount of weight on. This is a thing that I'm going to be really skeptical of. This one sounds like it can't possibly be describing a real thing. And so it's only useful as a case study in the propaganda. Like, when like Herodotus has his generals giving these long florid speeches, like, well, I'm not sure you were there. I'm not sure this is an actual transcript of what was said. Right. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But it's like, but it's still really interesting that he puts that in there. Like, you know, okay. So like, what, like, why is he putting it in there in that way? What does it say about the society that he's part of, that this is a thing that he's writing into those books and like, and like in an oral culture like that, they're probably not getting the whole exact word, word for word. But like, it does strike me as plausible that the general gist of the speeches could get passed down. Maybe in some cases they're lost and he has to make up something that sounds about right. But like, you know, there's enough storytelling and passing down of history that I would not be shocked if some of those speeches were in the right area of what the dude actually said. P- pretty close. But, yeah. That, that reminds me of, but, but that's, uh, that's a maybe, but yeah, <laughs> that, that reminds me of a, of a Twitter thread you put together on reading literature from different time periods and looking at what they take for granted. It's not exactly yes. the same idea, but it's something kind of similar where you, you could imagine that in an oral culture, people would likely have a much better memory for what they had heard, like a long speech, because this is the primary way they interact with, bodies of thought or bodies of literature. It's all oral. It's passed down in this way. And so it's it's plausible that a person could listen to a 45 minute oration and then go back and dictate almost line for line, exactly what they'd heard. And that moreover, you can analyze the, the spots that Herodotus probably filled in and look at that and say, what did, what did he feel that like, how did he feel the need to close that gap? And what does that say about the broader society he was a part of? It's a very interesting approach to, I don't know, anthropology or literary criticism with a view to history. I don't know what you'd call it exactly. Yeah. I would think of it as like, yeah. So it's a little bit like anthropology with the, with like the text itself as the thing you're doing anthropology on. And the way I think about it, I don't have like a crisp single term, but whenever you're reading a source, you don't just want to be thinking about the subject of the source. You want to be thinking about the, every part of the world that produced this object that you're now looking at. So you know, you want to be thinking about the battle that the author is describing or whatever. You want to be thinking about the author and why they're choosing to write what they write. And so the author is thinking about their audience. So you also have to think about the author's audience and what's, and like, why is the author choosing to present this to that audience? You know, 
maybe he's trying, you know, maybe, you know, someone like Polybius is like trying to sell the Roman occupiers to the Greeks who have sent him to rule, you know, uh, Polybius was, you know, a, a Greek who then got basically taken as a hostage by the right. Romans when uh, they took over and then a couple decades later was sent back to rule. And so as he's writing his history, he's trying to be like, this is why we should be doing what the Romans are saying and why you should be doing what I say. Right. Uh, or if you're reading, you know, some, uh, you know, you're, you're reading some, you know, history book with a cute title that was published in 2018. It's like, okay, why did this author choose this subject instead of some other subject? Why are they including these things? Like some of them, you can tell that the point is that they, there's a particular audience who they have in mind and they're trying to appeal to and sell more copies to. And it's like, okay, one, what does that mean about what will be included or left out or where the thumb will be on the scales in their analysis Two. What does it say about our society that this is a thing that happens? Right, <laughs> right. That's a, yeah, I'm that's always a, amazed at how few people in history admit that they're wrong. There's just it's, very few. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 never a it's sometimes a long term winning move, but like it's yeah. it's rarely a short term winning move. So people who do it either tend to be playing a very long game or just be you know way more concerned with their internal code of ethics than with how they look in the moment, which unfortunately not everyone is. Right. Talk, yeah. talk to me about great founder theory. Uh, I've always been curious as to how it's different from just the standard great man theory of history. Yeah. So great founder theory, as many of our listeners probably know, is the body of theory that Sam Borio, who's my mentor, has been working on for quite some time and the general theoretical framework that I'm operating in also. Uh, so it definitely, so like the sort of general great man theory, it posits that a lot of history is shaped by specific individuals. Uh, and then there's, uh, then a bunch more like filled in on how precisely does that work? Cause you have something like that. It's not clear, like, okay, so suppose we're going to take for the sake of argument that Napoleon shaped things real in a big way. Was this because of the strength of his will? Was this because he was just incredibly skilled and could win battles? He knew where to position the troops. Like, what was it? Like, you can imagine many different things it might be about Napoleon or about James Watt or about uh, Roosevelt or whoever that caused them to shape how history went. And great founder theories claim is that what's really important is the shape of institutions. And if you trace the history of how institutions are built, what you'll find is that it's usually they're changing pretty, you know, pretty small changes, pretty marginal, pretty continuous, except every now and then a person comes in who completely changes the shape of the institutions and designs something really, really functional that works really well. And then a bunch of people copy the shape of those institutions. And that this is the thing that, that makes great founders have a really strong influence on history is that they build the social order in new ways, which because they work really well, get copied by a lot of other people and uh, like change the change the landscape in their wake, uh, which, you know, in general, people are mostly on board with institutions matter a ton. Uh, some people have this model of how they work where they're sort of evolving on their own in this incremental way, which is often true, but they're very, very complex. They're often much more machine-like and that you need a whole lot of different pieces that are useless on their own, unless you have a ton of other ones. And they are very frequently designed by people who just understand their society way, way better than everyone else. And so to go back to Napoleon, you know, you've got the Napoleonic codes and all of the laws that was that were written. Also, interesting fact, the general way that militaries are organized where you have like a general and you have like the staff under the general, like like the command staff, like this was, uh, I, I, Napoleon was, I forget if he was the inventor or the one who sort of like codified it and popularized it and caused it to spread across Europe. Uh, but like a lot of the organization of the militaries, like the way that we do like medals and awards, that was a Napoleon invention that everyone else just sort of picked up. We still do today. Uh, a lot of the centralized uh, Republican bureaucracy was, a Napoleonic invention. So 
And you get these really important people is by reordering the institutions in ways that endure after their death. That is the thing that they found. That is the thing that we're tracing. And that is like the main thing that, uh, so like here are the gears that cause these particular people. Like if you're looking at, you know, like it's not just on the scale of like, you know, the giant heroic conquerors who get all of the, you know, books and history channel specials. Like if you, if you're looking at like, you know, how Hollywood is set up at some point, you're going to find, you know, a guy or a small handful of guys who basically figured it out. If you're looking at Silicon Valley, like the idea of like the ideas of Silicon Valley, like the founder who's like the CEO and the CTO and like the venture capital investment, like there are specific people who figured out that this was a good way to do things and shaped a lot of the culture around it. And so you can find this sort of fractally true at larger and smaller scales. I'd, I'd like to hear your your thoughts on <clears throat> how influential Elon Musk will be in the history books moving forward with what he's trying to accomplish. Uh, yeah, I think that it's not super obvious. It sort of depends on how far he gets. Uh, like, if he lands on Mars, then that's going to have him in the history books for at least a few hundred years, because I think it will be well earned if he, if he does get there. Uh, I hope he does. It's not obvious that he will. Uh, if this is like the peak of how far his space program gets and how far his industrial empire gets, then I would imagine that he's not going to stick around in the popular consciousness for too, too long. Uh I think of him as a very effective industrialist who's doing quite a good job of executing a long, like, uh, uh, like executing functional things and navigating the existing institutional landscape very well in a lot of ways. Uh, I don't think of him as a great founder because my impression is that his he's not doing a huge amount of like novel institution design. It's mostly that he's very good at operating the existing institution of design sort of at the peak of how far you can push them, which like is really great. We need more of that. Uh, but yeah, in terms of how he's going to remember it historically, like I think if he were remembered, it would be for greatness and he has not yet achieved the great things that he has set out to do. So we'll just have to see whether he actually gets it. Yeah, I was, I was actually going to ask about that because as, as you were describing the basic tenets of great founder theory, I was thinking about someone like John von Neumann, whose achievements are predominantly or entirely in the fields of science. His, his vision in that, in that realm was so far beyond everyone else's, but he predominantly operated within an existing institutional framework. And so we, we all use computers that are based on the von Neumann architecture and, and we use, well, we don't use game theory, but there's a an academic discipline devoted to the mathematical foundations he laid out with Oscar Morgenstern. Uh, but he didn't shape institutions insofar as I can tell. Neither did Einstein, not, neither did many other kind of great men of history. So is great founder theory distinguished because it focuses on the institutions and that's kind of the primary unit of analysis and it's just agnostic to the other sources of, of societal change or sources of greatness? Or is there just a, an element that I'm missing? Yeah. So generally speaking, I think that if you look at the people who shape the course of history, you know, you have the sort of institutional, you know, your generals, your statesmen, your businessmen, who I think fit pretty neatly into the institutional framework of great founder theory. And then you have like the scientists and technologists who seem like the other category with the really, really big impact on the world. Uh, arguably also like artists and culture leaders, but let's not get into that right now. We've got enough on our plate uh, <laughs> where, yeah. So from the perspective of great founder theory, these people are much more of a resource rather than like, you know, active players who they tend to be quite important for how like the, the more institutional players are able to deploy them or are able to deploy the products of their work. Uh, you have very rare exceptions who are doing both at once. Uh, Thomas Edison and uh, is, I think, about the only one who comes to mind, uh, possibly Werner von Braun, although I'm not sure how much in institutional innovation he's doing or if he's another Musk type pushing the envelope of the existing ones. I'd have to look closer. But this is very rare. 
uh, much more often you will see them, you know, like the Manhattan Project, where they are basically being, you know, the 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 people who have control of the institutions are determining what happens with the products of the of the technologists and the scientists is from is, is much is uh, much more how I tend to look at it. I think describes most of the cases, and then the question of where exactly do the technologists arise and what is the effect of their work more than a, this sort of very crude powering up or not powering up the, the institutional controllers is I think actually a much trickier problem, which predicting technological progress and the consequences of technological progress is extraordinarily hard. I think it's a lot harder than predicting the institutional side of things. And I do not have a good theory of that. So it's institutions are a bigger lever. And so ultimately most effects are downstream of them. And therefore that's why you, you put your focus on that. Uh, yeah. Or like most of the time, the hand on the lever is going to be institutional. And then the lever will, can be like a bureaucracy that's been built and doesn't really have like the will behind it, or it can be like, you know, a technology that's been built. And so if you're looking at where are the intervention points in changing human society, if you want to be able to accomplish specific things that you have in mind ahead of time, uh, I think that tends to come from the institutional side. And the whole, like the consequences of the technological and scientific progress, because it's so, you know, it, it's so much unpredictable, both in its causes and its effects, doesn't seem to me like as good an entry point if you are looking for ways that you can knowably, you know, cause things to be better, which is like what's the reason for investigating all this is, you know, I do love to know about it just for its own sake, but the reason I went down this path rather than some other path is because if you want to make society better, that's a lot easier if you know how society works. Otherwise, you're trying to fix a car engine without knowing how the engine works. So. Right, right. So I, I wanted to ask two questions uh, by way of follow-up. Number one is, how do you define an institution? So this is a word we've used a lot. What's your definition of it? And then what do you think are the core functional institutions in society today? Yeah, so I think of an institution as basically a coordinated group of people, like a formal one. So not just like, you know, if you imagine some Illuminati conspiracy that meets around the dinner table, but is, you know, formally doesn't exist, that would not be an institution in this sense necessarily. But like, it's, uh, but it's one that, <clears throat> so the institutions that are like worth thinking about, this might not be part of the strict definition. I might think of like, you know, a, a local circle of writers that gets together to decide which of their, you know, extremely niche niche short stories that have been published are going to get some award that might technically be an institution. That's not really what I mean. I mean, the ones that are like, when I'm talking here, I'm talking about sort of the load bearing ones that serve important functions in society that are relied on either by individual people to get what they need uh, so like the power company is an institution because it means I can have electricity so that we can be having this conversation. Right. So that's the way in which I'm relying on this institution for something, or they can be things that are like are relied on by other institutions in this sort of complex web. I don't really go to some logistics company and be like, Hey, I need to make sure that this tea kettle gets onto this container ship for me. But you know, when I buy something from Amazon, that does go through that sort of intermediary institution. Uh, and so these are so these examples are on the very physical side because those are often the easiest to think about, but I'm also including things like courts or you know the way the Federal Reserve makes the money supply be a particular way so that like all of the financial coordination that we do can hopefully not explode. Uh, so I'll, or like you know, one would hope that news media is, there's a bunch of functions one would hope it performs. I think they have been doing not as great as I would like, but that's another type of function that I think of as very load bearing. So, you know, to go to your other question about the core, I think the core institutions in any like contemporary society uh, tend to be quite similar. There's a sort of general pattern for how a state is structured or a society is structured that have spread across most of the world where uh, 
you know, the formal government, I definitely count the sort of major businesses, obviously, uh, you know, media, academia, military, like, it's not like a sharp line of what is the core, but, but it's like, what are the central institutions that are coordinating with each other other to generally set up how the society is run and which the rest of society depends on in order to not fall apart, in order to have the very important functions handled that not every person or every institution is handling, you know, law for themselves. Cause that would, I'm, I'm, that would cause some problems if everyone were <laughs> handling that internally instead of, you know, you know, maybe there are some anarchists who think it would be better, but certainly that's not the way our society is currently shaped. Yeah. I, I don't actually know any anarchists who think everyone should be their own police force. Usually there's a private agency and there's various ways in which they think you would handle a public good, like national defense. I, I'm not entirely sure I'm on board with all that, but just for the record, I don't know anybody who thinks that everyone should be an army unto themselves. <laughs> if yeah. that let, lets you sleep any better at night. It, it has yeah. become a, uh, Oh, go ahead, Thomas. A lot, a lot of what you're referring to is um, I think of as systems rather than institutions. And um, I, I guess the institutions are the ones that implement the systems um, and maintain them. Uh, but this idea of <clears throat> which, uh, which systems are changing and which ones can be changed and uh, which ones should be changed. A lot of, <clears throat> as an example, our system of weights and measurements that much of the world is based on right now, time and, and weights and volumes and things like that, none of that makes sense when you go to a different planet. Um, because the gravity is different on a different planet, the atmosphere is different. All of those systems of weights and measurements actually go out the window because they they don't pertain to some some new place. Um, it's it's uh, we're very myopic in how we we view these things, and we're we're much more inclined to stick with an existing system rather than that we know is flawed in so many ways, rather than make the changes necessary. Um, have have you uh, done a lot of research on this idea of systems theory and the um, the, the underlying motivations and effects that it has on society? Uh, not a ton. I've done like I've read a little bit from that front lens. It's not one where I consider myself like deeply familiar. I think that it is like yeah, like you have to consider like. I'm not sure I'm super on board with make like there are some circumstances where I think it makes sense to make a pretty sharp distinction between the system and the institution implementing it. Uh, but I have found that most of the time I feel like I get more mileage by considering them as like not cleanly separable. Uh, but it's definitely, you do have, yeah, like the systems absolutely are a huge and important piece and like, yeah, they tend to change pretty gradually. Like you said, most of the time, except in the crisis periods when they suddenly change quite rapidly. Very interesting. It, it has become popular to forecast the imminent demise of the United States. And I know that Samo has commented on this and, and you've commented on this in various places. So do you think it's true that America is in a state of serious decline or are those concerns overblown? Do we, do we still have 100 years or 200 years? Uh, so I think we're in a state of serious decline. I also think that we have like quite a long time. I don't think we're going to, you know, descend into, you know, collapse of the Soviet Union and the breakaway Republic of West Texas or <laughs> any of the sort of Mad Max stuff. Uh, if they so, have anything to say about it, then we might. <laughs> <laughs> that well, It's quite an if. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but like, so in general, I think that the, so the U.S. has gone through like three big periods of rise and decline of like the institutions being set up. And then so the general pattern you always see is the institutions are set up and built. And when they're set up and built, sometimes they are set up in a very functional way. And then slow decay and decline as the institutions sort of warp a bit and are sort of turned to the purposes of the people running them instead of the purposes they were initially built for. 
And as the purposes they were initially built for change, and so they don't really apply. We have a lot of norms about free speech that were built for broadcast media like television and radio and just don't really apply to how one should act ethically on the internet because that's a very different environment. And so there's sort of this shear between what the institutions were built for and like what the systems were built for if, uh, and the current landscape of like what's demanded from the systems to make it function. So in the United States, it was first founded, you know, you've got the founding fathers and like all those guys in the powdered wigs and so they build a thing, you know, they're writing there, you know, if they were today, it would be the giant blog posts and like the debates and the comments. But, you know, then there was just the flame the wars and stuff. Yeah, the Constitution yeah and they were wars. some really intense flame wars. And they're, you know, reading all of the old philosophy and they're like, OK, now we figured it out. We had these, you know, giant week long arguments with each other. And now here's the way it's going to sit up. And that works for a while. But eventually it sort of decays. It stops working. Uh, and then. The next and, and, the, and then in like the mid late 1800s civil war and especially reconstruction we get this very new institutional setup the government's working quite differently the business realm is working very very differently trusts and what we would now start calling like national corporations start becoming a really big player in the economy and sort of reshaping how a lot of the, uh, these things are done and you get like another system that works for quite a long time uh eventually it slowly decays uh and then uh, middle of the 20th century, Great Depression, then the New Deal, which is the system that we're currently on. It was built around then. If you trace the major institutions, the major government uh, <coughs> bureaucracies, if anything important that starts with Department of was almost certainly started during the New Deal. Uh, and so a lot of our general institutional setup comes from that time. That was the most recent time that we had this big founding. And then we've been decaying again since then. It's been sort of getting kind of skewed. I see two ways this could go. Uh, it could be that we then get another, like we get sort of a fourth institutional setup of the United States. You get a lot of really new things being done, a lot of changes in a way that works pretty well. And we're on another upward swing and this buys us another 70, 80 years. Uh, or you don't get these for free. It could also be that we don't get one of these and the sort of slow slide continues. Uh, and I think that this would not look like a sharp collapse and a big, you know, the year is 2032 and, you know, <laughs> New England is now its own sovereign state and there are, you know, there's no passage between California and the rest of the union. I think it looks much more like the, the decline of the British empire a starting like a hundred years ago. Uh, where, you know, as early as World War I, you have, you know, the British writing reports to each other like, guys, like, we just fought this giant world war and we couldn't have done it. Like, we were, we were not producing enough steel for the shells. We would have had no ammunition if we weren't importing it from the Americans. We used to be the industrial powerhouse of the world. What's going on? Uh, but, like, they were doing, they were going through this deindustrialization. They were going through this sort of slow institutional slide. They didn't get a revival on this scale and like they've they lost their empire they lost all of the you know world striding the sun never sets etc cetera, etc cetera. but like britain is not a hellhole it's not a terrible place to live i visited there it's actually quite nice and so i think that that is the most likely decline scenario where it puts us on like a hundred ish year uh clock to you know, maybe in the year 2060, we'll have our inversion of the Suez crisis. Uh, there was a, well, uh, around the time, uh, a bunch of the British people were getting very worried about their decline. And one of them said to the, uh, to the, said to the others who are like running around, there's a lot of ruin in a nation, which meant that like, this can decline a long way before it gets to the sort of like apocalyptic scenarios you're envisioning, which is sort of how I feel about us today. Well, I don't so know. That I'd love to get your your input on what what effect you think cryptocurrency and blockchain will have on on the course of history moving forward. Uh, yeah. So this is another one. I feel a little bit like the Elon Musk question, where I think it could end up being, you know, there's a bunch of potential, but it sort of needs to stick the landing if it's going to be worth remembering 200 years from now, where I think that, so the most likely scenario I can spin 
where it gets, where it becomes a really big deal. Like, I don't, you know, there's this old, not, not very old, but this sort of like cypherpunk idea from the very early days of like, it's going to break free of all of the state surveillance and it's going to be the sort of anarchist can't be controlled, break all of the financial controls. I think that time has shown it's not likely to go down that direction. Uh, but I do still think it could end up so far. It's basically been used as a speculation vehicle and not very much else. Uh, it could be that it does that for a while and then sort of fades. It could be that it does that and ends up and just stays being a speculation vehicle, but doesn't really have any larger impacts than that and ends up being kind of a footnote. Uh, but if I'm trying to tell the most plausible story I can, where it ends up really changing like the course of history, my current guess is, so there's been a few times where uh, it, like, as the balance of power between nations changes, uh, you will often see that like a superpower will uh, set up its own system of like financial, like the financial deals across the world or like the financial coordination. So the current one with the sort of dollar based dollar as the reserve currency was set up shortly after World War II when America was sort of on top of everything. Before that one, the British were the ones who were sort of controlling world trade and were setting up the gold standard and this very precise system of exchanges between the different currencies pegged to gold in particular ways. Uh, you often see transitions in these systems of global financial coordination, you know, when the superpowers change. And so if America doesn't get revived in the next couple of decades, it's pretty likely that it will stop being this sort of unitary global superpower. You can already see you know, some signs that at the fringes of the American empire is sort of withdrawing. If this continues, then eventually the sort of American imposed financial coordination where America can be like, oh no, you don't get to participate. We're like sanctions on anyone who tries to trade with this guy or that guy and like underpinning it with the institutions like the World Bank and the IMF. That eventually, uh, if the decline and pullback continues, which it might or might not, that won't be sustainable forever. I think it's quite plausible that uh, whatever comes next, whatever superpower or a small collection of superpowers sets up another uh, regime of financial coordination, they very well might incorporate cryptocurrency. That might mean the existing cryptocurrencies, that might mean they want Bitcoin as the sort of very verifiable thing they can use between them, similar to gold under the British regime. Uh, it could be something very different. It could be something you know, with much more surveillance baked in as like a new thing that gets developed so that they can track everything and know what's going on. There's a bunch of ways it could go. Uh, but that I think is the way that's uh, reasonably likely uh, that cryptocurrency could end up having a pretty big effect on global finance rather than, you know, the sort of speculation vehicle it's mostly been so far. So that's a fairly ambiguous note to end on, but I nevertheless want to want to thank you for your time and for all this this fascinating conversation. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, this is great. Thank you.